morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Uh, before we continue looking at uh, uh, 1st Timothy, Chapter 4, uh, can one of uh, you please lead us in prayer, please? Can I ask uh, Stavani to lead us in prayer? Sure, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly and gracious Father God Almighty, we are so very thankful to you for this time of learning. We thank you, Father, for leading us from glory to glory. And you have brought us to this day, Father, when we will be diving deeper into your word. We will be diving deeper into your uh, truth, Lord, Father. Lord, enrich us today, Father. Let your word richly dwell in us. Help us to walk in, in your word, Father, and see your glorious, uh, Lord, ways uh, being revealed to us, Father, so that we can use this word, we can walk in this word, and, Lord, uh, do a good service to the kingdom of god father and and bring many to the knowledge of your truth father anoint pastor selena as she is imparting the truth to us father bless her in all the ways and walks of life continue to hold her protect her keep her safe and sound and healthy father in all your ways bless all the students who are part of this ministry and group father bless everyone anoint us father to receive the word in its fullness and glorify your name through our lives we give you glory, honor, and praise for this platform. Thank you for leading us and guiding us. In Jesus' name, we ask and we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, so continuing from, uh, you know, verses 10 and 11 that we stopped um, uh, last Monday, we are looking at First Timothy chapter 4, verses uh, 10 to 11 where uh, Timothy is basically writing, uh, sorry, Paul is basically writing to Timothy, instructing him uh, on how to be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Um, he says, you know, uh, you need to be nourished in the faith and good doctrine and carefully follow it, not giving to, uh, you know, teachings um, uh, that are of uh, false teachers, false doctrines. And then he continues on in verses 10 and 11. He says in verse 10, for this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. So Paul is reminding uh, Timothy that as ministers of God, you know, uh, we labor towards this. We labor towards establishing uh, God's people in words of faith and sound doctrine. So this is what you need to labor towards. He's saying you need to labor towards towards faith and sound doctrine and also towards exercising holiness in our own lives. And when we exercise holiness in our own lives, you know, uh, it will automatically lead people uh, to, to live in holiness and uprightness and righteousness uh, before God. And he says, as we labor towards this, you know, we will suffer reproach. So he's basically reminding uh, Timothy about what is his call, what is his responsibilities, what is his duties, um, what is the calling, the responsibility of, uh, you know, of a, of a good minister uh, in Christ uh, Jesus. And, uh, you know, he's reminding him about all of these things. And he's saying, uh, hey, even as you go about doing all of these things, yes, you will suffer reproach as you are suffering now. You will, you know, you will be spoken bad about, you will be despised, you will be hated, you will be criticized. Uh, and, you know, he knows that Timothy is facing um, all of these things. And uh, because he's facing this, he does not want to remain anymore in Ephesus. He wants to come back to be with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Paul because his role here at Ephesus is very challenging, very difficult. But Paul is reminding him who he is, what is his calling, what is spoken into his uh, life uh, through the prophecies that he has received through his ordination, and also who is a good minister of Christ. Uh, and he's saying that even as you go about doing all of these things you will suffer reproach but he says we trust in the living uh, God and he says it is God who will strengthen you God who would uh, uh, you know help you God who would uh, uh, you know enable you to do what he has entrusted you to do and what he has called you to do because he is uh, faithful and he says you know because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men so basically you know uh, 
this phrase, Savior of all men, you know, uh, even as we preach and teach, our priority uh, should be on the message of Jesus Christ. It should, our priority should be the gospel. Our priority should be about the person and the work of Jesus Christ, what he has accomplished, what he has did, and how he uh, lived his life here on earth. The, the phrase, Savior of all men, does not mean that all men will be saved, uh, you know, uh, in a universal way, in a universalistic uh, sense. That's not what it's meaning here. But it means that there is only one Savior uh, for all men, and that one Savior is Jesus Christ. So many people take this and uh, this phrase and say he's a savior of all men, which means, you know, because Jesus died on the cross, you know, automatically everyone will be saved, everyone will go to heaven. Uh, no, it's not talking about that. Uh, it does not mean that all men are saved in a universalistic way or in, in a universal sense, but it means that there is only one savior for all men, and that savior is Jesus Christ. And Paul is encouraging Timothy uh, as he writes in verse 11, these things command and uh, teach. So uh, we looked at this, this word command is actually can, uh, is translated as order. So, you know, what Paul is telling Timothy is when you enter the pulpit or you stand in the pulpit uh, to preach, uh, don't uh, do it with speculations and opinions and theories of men. Uh, but you are to fearlessly proclaim God's word. You are to fearlessly proclaim the truth. You are to fearlessly proclaim the, uh, the doctrine and proclaim it as a command, as an order. There is no other alternative. This is the set thing and this is what should be done. Um, and don't give in to the fear of man. Don't give in to the fear of man thinking what would, you know, uh, uh, other leaders, other people who are older to me, uh, who are preaching wrong doctrines say, if I talk about doctrines that correct their doctrines, their false doctrines, but he says, fearlessly proclaim the truth, fearlessly proclaim uh, the doctrine, even as you enter the pulpit, don't do it with, you know, just speak about opinions and theories of men, but teach the truth of God's word, the solid truth of God's word and the uh, doctrine. And what does he mean when he says, you know, command and teach these things? So what does this uh, two words or this phrase, these things refer to? It's basically talking about, uh, you know, all the instructions that Paul has given Timothy from verses 1 to 10, where he warns him about uh, false teachers. He tells him to protect the flock or the sheep from false teachers and to avoid this false teaching himself and how he should discipline himself uh, to godliness and also, you know, train others in uh, godliness. So, you know, he's saying these things which I have just mentioned to you about all of those things which I've talked about, you know, you know, teach it, you know, command and say it as a command, as an order, okay? And uh, even as Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, these instructions were not just for Timothy, but it was also for the church at uh, Ephesus because this letter will be read uh, by Timothy uh, to the people uh, in the various house churches at uh, Ephesus. So here in this in this uh, uh, two verses, verses 11 and 12, we see again the quality of a good minister. So the quality of a good minister here is to preach and teach the truth of God's word preach and teach the doctrine in God's word with authority and with the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Okay, we'll move on to verse 12. Uh, can somebody read verse 12, please, quickly? Uh, verse 12, no one, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to believers in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Thank you. So, amen. So he says, no, don't let anyone despise the youth, but be an example to believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in uh, truth. So, you know, uh, 
Timothy was young, you know, just big 30, 33, 34 years old. Uh, and Paul is encouraging him to be an example to the believers. And he's saying as a leader, he needs to set the standard. He needs to be the role model. And when he is, you know, uh, living in godliness and holiness and reverence towards God and in everything that he does, you know, no one will look down on him because he is uh, young. You know, they will not stop him and say, hey, you're young, you don't know anything, we're much older to you, we have much experience. You know, they will just listen to you because you are, you know, conducting yourself in a way, uh, your lifestyle, the way you do things at, uh, at all things, at all times, you're doing it uh, with uh, holiness, in godliness, uh, in reverence to God. Uh, uh, and it's alongside what you're preaching and teaching and what the word of God, the truth of God's word is uh, admonishing us or telling us or instructing us. So he says, be an example in word, which means in speech, what you say and how you say it. Um, it's also not just for Timothy, but we can also learn as some of us who say, hey, I'm not a minister of Christ. I'm not a pastor or I'm not a teacher. I'm not a minister, I'm not an evangelist, missionary. I'm just a lay person, but uh, who we all, uh, irrespective of who we are, if we are born again, we belong to the family of Christ. You know, uh, our identity now is that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? We, are, we all are priests unto God, okay, serving God in whatever, in whichever area. So uh, it, this applies to us as well. We need to be an example, set an example in our word, in speech, what we say, how we say it in our conduct, in the way we live our lives, the way we behave, um, the way we act, because people are constantly watching us. Uh, you know, conduct basically refers to our behavior, our lifestyle. Uh, it also uh, refers to how we handle our time, uh, how we spend our time, how we handle our money, uh, our family, our friendships, you know, uh, the way we dress, the way we work. Uh, our entertainment, uh, uh, every aspect of our life, you know, uh, we need to have a godly conduct in every area, you know, even when it comes to handling money, it comes to our entertainment, uh, uh, the, our personal appearance, the way we look, the way we dress, our work, our friendships, uh, the places that we go to for our entertainment, all this, you know, uh, should be in a way that is godly, that is uh, 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 you know, is holy and, uh, you know, is uh, uh, shows our reverence towards a holy uh, God. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, you know, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it uh, all for the glory of uh, God. So he says, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, you know, do it all for the glory of God. Sometimes we think, hey, it's okay for us to eat this or for also for us to, you know, drink this. But when people are watching us, Paul is saying, you know, I, I might as well not eat certain things, uh, even though it's not going to affect my conscience. It's not going to make me a sinner before God. Uh, if, uh, I will not drink certain things, even though it, for me, it's not going to prick my conscience, make me feel guilty or make me feel as a sinner before God. But he's saying, I'm going to do it because others are watching me and I don't want to be a stumbling block to others. I don't want to be a hindrance to uh, others. So sometimes, you know, we need to watch our life and conduct so closely uh, uh, because, you know, you might, you're, you're a parent, you're an older adult in your family, there are younger uh, uh, children, uh, your niece, nephews, younger ones in the family are watching you in church. You know, if even if you're not teaching in children's church or Sunday school, you're just attending church, there are children who are watching you. There are uh, teens who are watching you. There are young adults who are watching you and they're learning from the way you dress, the way you act, uh, uh, how you come to church, how you worship God. They're just looking at you and they are uh, learning. So whatever you do, whether, whether you're even eating or drinking, uh, even dressing, you know, the way you speak, uh, do everything for the glory of God. Um, God. So we need to model godliness uh, in our daily conduct, even in the areas of eating and drinking and everything else. Like, for example, uh, Daniel, right? Daniel, even in the area of food, uh, 
he it might seem very insignificant and very small for us but even in that area of food he wanted to honor god he wanted to obey god's commands and laws you know he could have made an excuse saying hey you know we are in uh, in another country we have follow their laws their culture uh, we can't go by our laws we are now slaves to them if you don't obey it you know we will be killed why should i lose my life uh, he could have had a thousand reasons uh, 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 to say yes to the food that was offered from the king's table, but he chose not to. And we see that, you know, God was, God honored that, God honored what he uh, did and gave him wisdom. And uh, he was, you know, uh, made an officer in the Babylonian court and was able to impact uh, that nation for uh, God in a very powerful uh, way. So we need to model godliness in our conduct in all things and at all times. The next thing he says is in love. Uh, we need to love God's people irrespective of who they are, the culture, their, uh, their status, their social status, um, uh, their education background, just love people, um, basically because the basic commandment, the, the, the important commandment is that, you know, we need to love our neighbors just as we love ourselves, as Jesus said. The next thing he says is in spirit. Uh, the spirit is, you know, the kind of person you are. It's basically who you are, your nature, your characteristic, your character. That is who you really are. So we need to, uh, you know, practice godliness and reverence even in that area and in faith, you know, in our faith with uh, uh, Walk, uh, faith walk with God in us just trusting God uh, or, uh, in in times of um, uh, challenges and difficulties and at all times as well you know having uh, faith in God and the last thing he says is in purity and holy uh, living and this is specifically very important especially important for Timothy uh, even as he pastored and was a spiritual overseer uh, uh, at Ephesus because you know Ephesus was uh, uh, was a location for the temple of Dinah and uh, she had a lot of temple prostitutes there was a lot of immoral sex that was happening and uh, and the immoral sex that was taking place was as as a major way or means uh, uh, they used to please uh, this goddess and uh, uh, they sought prosperity from uh, her so sex and sexuality was something that was very exalted in the city was something was very prominent in the city uh, the whole culture revolved around this and also kind of uh, you know impacted the 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 greek uh, the, the greek and the roman world uh, as well and so timothy uh, you know needed to know that he had to model purity both in his conduct um in his life the way he lived his life his nature his uh, characteristic and also in the way that he related with young women he goes on to talk about this in the next chapter uh, in first timothy chapter 5 verse 2 and uh, he says he needs to you know model purity both in his conduct with young women and uh, you know, uh, it, throughout uh, his life and in every aspect of his uh, life. The purity is actually not just an outward uh, issue. Uh, it is something that is a heart issue, which translates into us living a pure life. So if our minds, our thoughts are pure, our heart is pure, then the actions that, you know, result or our behavior or our, our character uh, will be a pure and uh, holy. So, you know, uh, uh, this is what uh, is, uh, he says is very important that you need uh, to be godly, you know, to set an example in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Okay. So as uh, ministers of God, as those who are called as a royal priesthood, we too need to model uh, godliness in every area of our lives. Uh, and when we model, uh, you know, godliness in every area of our lives, you know, it will uh, lead to, you know, provoking others also to godliness. Okay, we'll move on to verse 13. Uh, can somebody read verse 13, please? Susan, you like to read verse 13? Yes, ma'am. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Amen. Thank you, Susan. So, uh, 
Paul is telling Timothy till he comes and meets him again, you know, pay attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So basically reading means the public reading of scriptures. Exhortation means preaching, uh, teaching, encouraging, inspiring, and com bringing comfort from scripture. And doctrine means, you know, teaching and instruct, uh, instructing uh, from the word of God. So he says, you know, read public reading of scriptures. Exhortation is basically preaching, encouraging, inspiring, and comforting from scripture. And doctrine is teaching and instructing from uh, scripture. So when Paul tells Timothy, you know, to be devoted to public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching, you know, it this was something that was very relevant or important in that culture because many people were illiterate and very few of them owned manuscripts, uh, not like us. We have so many different uh, versions of the Bible. Some of us have not just have one Bible, we have many different versions of the Bible. Um, but in those days, you know, uh, not many of them could own manuscripts. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the the Old Testament Torah was read to them. And after it was read, you know, uh, Timothy was to preach, uh, to exhort, uh, uh, which means to challenge people to apply God's word in their own lives. And also, you know, to pass on uh, the doctrines in the Bible uh, by teaching them about those um, doctrines and we see that this this method of uh, you know of propagating god's word was practiced in judaism uh, in the synagogues jews would stand up and read god's word then somebody would explain uh, and apply the text in their context uh, for example in nehemiah chapter 8 when nehemiah goes to jerusalem to build the walls of jerusalem we see after he builds the walls you know ezra and the levites read the old testament laws for uh, six hours and explain it to the Israelites who are standing for six hours. And in uh, chapter 8, uh, verse 8 of uh, the book of Nehemiah, it says they read the book of God's law, explaining it, imparting insight. Thus the people gained understanding from what was uh, read. So this was a, a culture, this was something that was practiced in Judaism. And we also see that Christ did this. He, when he went to the temple, he, he read the scripture, he explained to them Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And we also see Paul doing it when he goes to synagogues, he reads the scripture, explains it. Uh, we read about this in Acts chapter 13, verse 15. So, uh, you know, in the context of our present day, in, in the context of our local church today, you know, we need to see these three things happening. Uh, we need to read God's word. We need to preach God's word. And we also need to teach the doctrine in God's um, word. Okay. So that was uh, verse 13, what he tells him to do. Any questions so far? Any doubts? Any thoughts? Yes, Divya. I uh, just had a uh, like a comment, uh, Pastor. Actually, there was uh, in 2022, I believe there was um, um, it's called uh, Creation Research Institute, and they held a one week uh, Bible memorization, uh, the whole of New Testament. Uh, people, I think there were a couple of people uh, around uh, seven to eight people who memorized books of the Bible. And they would just come to this uh, this uh, uh, stage, and they would just uh, just out of memory they are they are uh, saying the Bible. Uh, it was very such a something great to watch. So uh, uh, that public reading of the scriptures, like uh, so good. There are uh, ministries that in uh, that really practice this. Mm, they publicly read the scriptures. Um, and this this was very, such a beautiful thing to really behold because it's uh, it was awesome yeah of one the one whole week uh, like the uh, all the books of the Bible they were just mem uh, just mem out of memory they were reciting yeah it was called the Bible recital yeah nice thank yeah. you for sharing Vivia anyone else has any questions. Okay, if not, then we will move on to verse 14. Um, verse 14, it says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the 
uh, eldership. So uh, Paul is again here encouraging Timothy uh, not to uh, neglect the gift that is in him, uh, the calling that is in his life. You know, uh, the laying on of hands is basically what Paul had in mind was Timothy's ordination service when the church leaders, you know, the church elders laid hands on him and recognized God's call upon his life uh, to serve in full time uh, ministry, uh, to serve the Lord full time. Um, and also this event, you know, there were many people who prophesied over uh, Timothy and, and sure Timothy remembers those prophecies, remembers that time when he was ordained. And so he says, you know, don't neglect uh, the gifts, you know, and he goes on to talk about uh, in Second Timothy, he says, tear up the gifts that is in uh, you. And uh, he says, you know, um, don't neglect the gifts, you know, you need to put them into use, you know, spiritual gifts, spiritual things can be uh, imparted, uh, can be received uh, to different ways, to teaching, to sharing, uh, it can also be imparted through our association with uh, men and women of God, even as we relate to people or associate them with them, fellowship with them, you know, uh, impartation can happen from one person to the other, spiritual things can be imparted to us. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, in, irrespective of how we receive the impartation, um, how we receive spiritual things, it's important for us here to exercise them. If we don't exercise the spiritual gifts, you know, they will remain dormant and, uh, you know, would have be of no uh, use. You can just say, hey, I am uh, baptized in the spirit. Uh, I can speak in tongues. Um, uh, I know that I, I can flow in all the nine gifts of the spirit. But what's the use if you're not going to use it, uh, you know, to... Um, uh, you know, to make Christ known or to reveal his presence and, the, and his power so that people can, can know that he is God and experience his presence and power uh, and uh, just enjoy, you know, who this God is and what he can uh, do for uh, them. So even though we receive spiritual things uh, through impartation, you know, uh, to various means, uh, it is important that we exercise them. If we don't exercise our gifts, whatever it is, not just the 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 the, the gifts of the spirit. You know, other gifts like um, whether it's teaching, preaching, uh, writing, uh, you know, or uh, writing songs or whatever. You know, if we don't uh, exercise them, they will remain dormant and would not be of any use in extending or building the uh, kingdom of God and bringing glory to uh, Him. Okay, verse 15, can one of you please read verse 15, please? Practice these things, immerse yes. yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Amen, thank you. Uh, he says, meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Now, meditate on these things is basically not talking about, uh, uh, you know, the Eastern kind of meditation where we empty our mind. No, but when we're talking about meditation uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Christian context, when we're talking about meditating on God's word, it is filling our minds uh, with uh, the truth in God's word. It's filling our mind with uh, God's word. So Paul here is encouraging Timothy to meditate on these things. What are the things he's asking him to meditate on? The first thing is meditate uh, uh, or seriously ponder, uh, uh, think about uh, things that, you know, uh, uh, think about these things that he's writing to the, him, give himself entirely to doing these things. And he says, if you do these things, you know, uh, you would you would grow and there will be progress. You will see these things happening in others. So Paul is encouraging Timothy to meditate uh, or seriously ponder about all the things that he is uh, speaking to, has spoken to him, is going to speak to him about, and give himself entirely to doing these things. And also, if he does so, you know, he will see growth and there will also be progress that he will see in the lives of others. And here he says, give yourself entirely to them, which means, uh, you know, Timothy was encouraged to give, uh, you know, uh, uh, Everything that he has, give to the work of the ministry or give it all, you know, uh, to, the, uh, to the calling that God has called him uh, to, to, to put, you know, uh, his maximum effort 
uh, and when he puts his maximum effort, gives his all, uh, you know, does everything that is required of him. Uh, in doing so, you know, he, there will be his progress and it will be evident to all. You know, people will see his progress, people will see godliness and holiness, and it will also, you know, uh, uh, will bring about change in the lives of others um, as well. So, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, or often, you know, uh, progress is not evident uh, because we don't give ourselves entirely to pursuing God, His will, or to what He has uh, called us to. But here, uh, the Word of God teaches us whatever God has called us to, whatever field He has called us to, you know, we need to give ourselves entirely to it, uh, you know, so that we can do what God has called us to do um, and do our very best and do things with uh, excellence. Uh, for the glory of his name and for the glory of his uh, kingdom. Look at what Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 10. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God that was uh, with me. So, Paul here is talking about, you know, he uh, he knows who he is, uh, but he knows uh, he's experienced God's grace, even though he was someone who persecuted him. Uh, and uh, he's, you know, and the, he's brought him to the position that he is now in uh, because of uh, his grace, uh, of God's grace on his life. But he does not take God's grace for granted. It does not make him feel comfortable and you know complacent and just sit back and enjoy that grace but he says even though i have this supernatural abounding uh, exceedingly great grace he says you know but i labor more abundantly you know than they all because paul is saying hey i'm here like you know an apostle i've done so much i don't have to do anything more but he says even then i labor more than all my co-workers who are younger uh, to me so paul knew that spiritual growth just did not happen like that uh, it is uh, even though he knows the gift of god it's a grace of god but uh, even though it's given to him, you know, as a gift and a grace, you know, he needs to actively pursue it. He needs to labor. Okay. So uh, some of us in the, especially as Christian ministers, we can get very laid back, complacent, lazy uh, in the things of God, in ministering, uh, in doing things, you know, uh, we don't do anything that is new, innovative. They're not working hard. Uh, uh, because you know nobody's challenging us we don't have any um, uh, deadlines to meet like in the corporate world we don't have to face targets uh, and all of those things so things become very very uh, easy for us and we can get into a mode where we can become lazy and complacent but uh, you know uh, as God's word says we need to labor we need to work hard you know uh, we shouldn't have a passive attitude because uh, Jesus God rebukes that in the parable of the talents uh, we see that Jesus warned us against having a passive attitude uh, with that servant who did nothing about that one talent that he uh, received so we need to give ourselves entirely to the work whatever area God has called us to and, uh, you know, progress in it, do things with excellence so that our progress will be evident to all and, uh, you know, and uh, we can honor God uh, the way we do things uh, and bring glory to his name and also extend his uh, kingdom. Okay. We'll look at verse 16. Can one of you please read verse 16, please? Verse 16. Verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. So uh, this is his, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the last words in this chapter, but it's not his last words in for Timothy, but this is something very, very important. Paul is instructing Timothy to watch over his own life and what he is uh, teaching, he says, take heed. That means, uh, you know, Timothy and every pastor uh, or every leader, a spiritual, uh, you know, leader in uh, the churches at Ephesus must examine uh, constantly 
two areas uh, you know which are of importance or of great concern one is their own life and the other is doctrine so he's bringing this whole discussion to a close in this chapter he's saying you know uh, timothy and all of the you know bishops or deacons the elders in the church you must examine constantly examine uh, two great areas of concern one is your own life and the other is the doctrine okay and he says if you fail to do this it would bring danger uh, both for yourself and for the sheep, uh, for the people, uh, the flock under your care, for the congregation. You know, if we don't give heed to uh, our own life, the way we are living our life, or if Timothy does not give heed to his own life, his conduct, uh, his character, his nature, his and live a life that is godly, it might uh, he might uh, suffer shipwreck. You know, like he mentioned in the uh, uh, First Timothy chapter one verse nineteen, when he talks about uh, uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander. You know. Um, these two people you know, suffered shipwreck of their faith. They went away from the teachings, the truth of the, uh, of the word of God, from the doctrine. And uh, also, you know, their life was, uh, uh, you know, uh, went away. Their, their entire whole uh, thought process, their whole life, you know, uh, uh, was away from God. They were not living lives that were godly. So it says, give heed to your life. Others, you know, uh, you might suffer shipwreck. Uh, and also, he says, uh, give heed to the doctrine, because if you don't uh, give heed to the doctrine, it can shipwreck your own faith. You can go away and destroy your own life. And also, if you don't heed, give heed to the doctrine, you, know, you will lead others astray and uh, uh, leave them short of God's salvation. So even as, uh, you know, all of us as believers, you know, uh, uh, now studying God's word in detail, uh, we have a greater responsibility, you know, to take heed of the doctrine uh, and to take, take heed of our own life. If we don't take heed for the do of the doctrine, the truth in God's word, you know, it will, uh, uh, you know, shipwreck our own faith. It will destroy our own life and also destroy um, others, lead others ast uh, astray, lead them away from the faith. And will also, you know, um, uh, leave them short of God's uh, salvation. Okay. Um, so Timothy's primary call here is to watch his life closely uh, and watch the doctrine that he's talking about. Uh, so, you know, uh, he says, even as you are preaching and teaching, don't uh, preach to entertain people, amuse people, and even just talk about practical things, you know, prosperity gospel, feel good uh, gospel, uh, or positive gospel, so to say. But, you know, he's saying present the biblical doctrine uh, uh, and the truths in God's word. Uh, give heed to that doctrine, even as you are teaching it and preaching it, apply it in your own life, live it out and then teach it and then you will not shipwreck your own faith and others faith so this is not something that is just for um, timothy's for us as well you know uh, so we need to uh, study the doctrine study the word of god uh, you know uh, not just study it for knowledge sake but you know let it become so much part of our lives that we're living it and uh, you know uh, and teach it to others and not just teach uh, what will make people uh, happy, uh, will make them feel good, uh, prosperity gospel, feel good gospel, talking about practical things, all those are important as well, but, you know, need to teach them the solid truth, the doctrines from God's uh, word. So as spiritual leaders, you know, uh, all of us, you know, Timothy and the others and uh, us as well, uh, we need uh, this ability of self-governing, uh, you know, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we need to watch over our own lives and also watch over what we teach and preach. And that is why it's so important for you all, you know, uh, for all of us, you know, not just to come to class and um, listen to lectures, but go back and uh, study those notes, study 
uh, uh, the lect what you heard in the lecture, read God's word, so that you're so well grounded in the doctrine, so that you're able to impart it, you're able to teach it to others, uh, correct the false doctrines that are there in your own countries, your own nations, your own places, churches. And when you do so, you know, it will just protect yourself, it protect your life and also those who listen and learn from uh, us. Okay. So this is what he closes this chapter by telling um, Timothy that he needs to give heed to these two important things, his own life and what he teaches. And that applies to us also, uh, you know, as believers today. Any questions on chapter four? Yes, Divya. Uh, just uh, Pastor, based on this uh, verse, right, uh, our own life uh, to be an example. So uh, especially when uh, there are people who are leading, who are teaching, um, they tend to teach maybe the, you know, the truth of the word, but their life doesn't reflect it. Uh, so is that an indicator for us to, yeah, uh, if you go down the path, you might end up there. Is, is it an indicator? Maybe it's the right things that they're saying. Maybe it's the right uh, things from the word and all. But you, you, uh, we get to see some things that do not match up. Uh, so is that an indicator? Yes, it's also a learning for us that you know uh, we are we be very careful what we teach. Because people are watching our lives just like you are watching that person's life. It's an indicator, hey, people are watching my life, so I just be very careful what I'm preaching and teaching. I better not preach and teach what I am not doing or practicing. And if I'm going to preach and teach, let me practice that and then, you know, then uh, do it. Uh, also, an indicator that, you know, that person needs a prayer. Uh, so just pray and. Uh, you know, uh, that his eyes are, his or her eyes are open and they're able to see and not be blinded, uh, you know, uh, thinking that it's okay for them to live a certain way, but, you know, it's not okay uh, to come to that realization and that truth. So they also need our prayer support because, you know, we are all vulnerable, we are all weak, uh, we are not perfect, and also maybe need help. Uh, can be spoken to by elders, uh, you know, in a very encouraging way, can be pointed out too, so that uh, the person learns. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It's just like saying that those who teach will be held to greater, like, greater, like, standards, right? Accountability, or, yes. Accountability. Greater yeah. standards, yes. Yeah, thank you. But that does not mean that we come to a place where you say, hey, I'm not going to preach and teach now. Uh, because I'm not, my life is not there, and you know I'm not, I'm not godly. I have my own weaknesses. People know my past, blah blah blah. Uh, should not stop us, you know. But uh, uh, should come to a place where I say, yeah, God, you know, I'm, I'm preaching this, I'm teaching this, uh, but you know, uh, I've not been living it myself, and I'm just asking for forgiveness, and I'm going to make it a, you know, a practice to uh, do this from this day on, uh, and uh, you know do it so you are also learning we are all learning right uh, so even as i preach and teach there are many things that i don't do and i ask god for forgiveness say god i'm going to preach and teach this and i've not been doing it i've been slack in this area uh, please forgive me i'm going to do this uh, i'm going to make a conscious effort to do it and i make a conscious effort to do this so we're all learning we're all progressing and it's god's word that rebukes and corrects and trains us in righteousness and holiness but coming to a place where we overlook it and we're just preaching and teaching is because our conscience is slowly being dead and we need to do something to revive that person's conscience. Yeah. So speak to that person, tell that person. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. It really helps. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll go on to chapter five. Uh, can somebody uh read chapter five for us please and others can all open to first timothy it'll be nice if all of you can please open in your bibles uh to first timothy um uh, chapter five and can one of you please read first timothy chapter five for us clearly and slowly 
Ma'am, shall I? Yes, thank you, Rupa. Do not rebuke an older woman, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as brothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show how godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. But this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own of his household, he has denied his, the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enroll younger widows but when their passions draw them away from Christ. They desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having aban abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have anger widows marry, their children manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed from Satan straight after sit. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Let the elder, elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. But the scripture says, you shall not, shall not muzzle an ox when it dreads and out the grain and laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As per those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so, the, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep those, these rules without Prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, or take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conscientious, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So the good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, uh, Sister Rupa, for reading uh, First Timothy chapter five. Uh, now, for uh, purpose of our study, we will divide this chapter into five sections. Um, uh, we divide it based on you know what is being addressed here. So in verses one. Uh, two and three, you know, it's talking about relationships within the church. Uh, verses four to eight, it's talking about believers' responsibility towards their own family. Uh, verses nine to sixteen, it's talking about churches' responsibility towards widows. Verses seventeen to twenty, it's talking about leading uh, spiritual leaders. Verses 21 to 23, it's talking, uh, you know, it's personal notes uh, to a spiritual leader. And uh, verses 24 and 25, it's talking about the um, outcomes. 
Okay, so we look at verses one to three, where uh, Paul is basically talking about relationships within the church. Here in this verses, he is instructing this young man Timothy how to relate to people of different ages, even as he leads them all uh, spiritual. Okay, um, even as he's uh, writing this in a specific context uh, to a specific person and to uh, churches at Ephesus, you know, uh, these instructions can also apply to our own lives, uh, uh, you know, even as we relate to various people, uh, or even as we relate to one another in the house of God, we will learn how, uh, you know, we should treat one another, uh, how we need to honor uh, one another in the family, in the body of Christ or in the house of uh, God. And he begins this section by saying, do not rebuke an older man. So this word, do not rebuke, the word rebuke, the ancient Greek word for rebuke is not the normal word for rebuke uh, in the New Testament that is used here. Uh, in the other places, a different Greek word is used for rebuke. But here, uh, you know, uh, it's not the same word uh, rebuke that is mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. This is the only place here where he uses the different Greek word for rebuke. And so this word rebuke here in this um, in First Timothy chapter five, verse uh, one, is basically meaning, you know, or it's literally uh, saying, uh, you know, to strike at. So he's telling Timothy, you know, do not attack older men with words, but treat them with respect, even as he would treat younger men uh, with respect as uh, brothers. Okay, so here rebuke uh, does not mean that, you know, uh, it's a normal word that is used elsewhere in the Old Testament. It's a different word here used specifically here in this uh, passage, in this verse. It means to strike at. So he's saying don't attack older men uh, with words, but treat them with respect, even as you would treat younger uh, brothers. Okay, uh, we'll stop here. We'll go for a break and then we'll come back and look at uh, the rest of um, uh, chapter 5. Okay, thank you.